in the Old Testament, the individuals that when so many miracles take place, and yet they, they turn from God and then come back to their old ways. But aren't we like that? Don't we kind of lose sight of his faithfulness? But, you know, that's what we can acknowledge today is that it's because of his faithfulness that we can, we can stand firm. And that's how the rock we can establish our faith. It's not anything we can honor, anything we can do. So we just stand with him. This is a great way song to love this song. It just speaks to the faithfulness of God. And we can look, look at that today and just, just remember all the times that he's, he's been faithful in the past. And we know he's going to be faithful in the future. Great is thy
Amen. A wonderful worship today. I believe our Lord is pleased with what he has heard. It's all about him. So good to see everybody. I know the congregation is sort of split up with uh, some being here in the early service, quite a few this morning, and I'm glad you're here for this service. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Philippians chapter 4, and we're going to look at the first three verses of this chapter, and the children are dismissed while you're turning into children's worship. I sort of miss the big congregation where you don't hardly have any seats and people are looking for a place to sit. I love, I love that. Of course, uh, most preachers would, but uh, you should have plenty of room this morning. A quarrel disrupts a church of joy. If you've ever been a part of a conflict in a church family, you know how painful it can be. I was in one at 12 years old, and I saw things I will never forget and heard things. Church split. Friends divide when that type thing happens. Competing sides charge the other with being unchristian. Uh, These church conflicts bring deep scars into the body of Christ. And our reputation is strained in the community. Our Lord is saddened. And in his high priestly prayer, Jesus even prayed for his followers that we would be one like he and the Father were one. He told his disciples to love one another. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus told his listeners that if they were offering their gift at the altar, and they remembered that someone was against them, they were to get up, they were to leave their gift at the altar, and they were to go and reconcile with that brother or sister. So Jesus understood that it is difficult to worship when you're at odds with someone. God doesn't want us to compromise truth. If there's a major reason for a church to split, it's over truth. When a a church begins to go liberal and away from the word, uh, that's the time to really take a stand. But he does desire that we have peace, and he wants us to get along as Christians. And there's a story about six men who were stranded on a desert island, and two were Jewish, and two were Catholic, and two were Baptist. And the two Jews got together, and they founded the Temple Emmanuel on that island. And the two Catholics, they established the Church of the Holy Mary. And the two Baptists formed two Baptist churches. And they got into a squabble over who would use the name First Baptist. That sounds like Baptist, doesn't it, sometimes? I think you would agree with me, having studied through the book of Philippians, that the church at Philippi was one of the most pleasing one of the most pleasant churches in the New Testament. I think, as I have studied the Pauline epistles over the years, that the church at Philippi was one of Paul's favorite churches. All the way through the book of Philippians, as he writes to them, there's that fragrance of love, and and you're aware of the fact that every time he even thinks about the church, he even says in his heart, is filled with joy. In Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, the Apostle Paul says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, making requests always with joy. And so you'll find that type of note all the way through the letter. 
If there's one word that would characterize the book of Philippians, it would be the word joy. It's a love letter by the Apostle Paul to this wonderful, sweet, precious congregation of believers at Philippi. And when I think of Faith Memorial Baptist Church, I, I think of joy, the joy that I have experienced over the years. I wouldn't trade it for any congregation I know of. I do have pastor friends that have struggled in church after church, and maybe it's them, I don't know, or maybe it's the congregation or whatever, but I can't say that here. If I had to do it all over again, I would do it with you. How about that, as, as pastor? For 41 years, you have been my joy and the joy of my family. You are indeed a pleasant fragrance to my life. And that's the atmosphere that the Apostle Paul immersed himself in as he writes this love letter to the church at Philippi. And many people have been attracted into our fellowship and have been won to the faith in the Lord Jesus because of our atmosphere of sweetness and friendliness and love that I pray will always permeate this place. Amen. And as we come to Philippians 4 this morning, we see, though, there's something negative. Something negative is affecting the ministry of the Philippian church. There is a problem in the church. And uh, you do understand that a church is just made up of people. It's not the building. We are the church. We're the ecclesia. And so a church, though, is not a trophy case for the display of perfect believers. It's a, it's a hospital for the recovery and for the care of the just born again and saved believers. Amen. And we're going to heaven when we die, but we've got to remember we still haven't lost that sin nature, have we? I heard about a husband and wife who were having a little bit of disagreement. And finally, in frustration, the husband said to his wife, you must think I'm a perfect idiot. She says, no, I don't think anybody is perfect. <laughs> there are no perfect churches, not even the church at Philippi. And did you know that a little mouse can get in your wall? I think it happened to Geneva and I one time when we lived in the Ringgold area. A mouse got in the wall, and it can get in the attic, and it causes the most obnoxious odor that you have ever smelled. You can have a beautiful house, but if you've got a mouse in the wall, it, it affects the home, let me tell you. And the problem in the ch church at Philippi was just a little thing, but Paul knew, left unattended, it could become a major thing. And I want you to see this morning how Paul addresses this problem. Let's, let's start with verse 1. We find Paul, we find his appeal to the people to stand firm, to stand fast in the Lord. He says in verse 1, therefore, he's referring back to what he's just written about our citizenship being in heaven and all of that. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and long for my joy and crown so stand fast in the lord my dearly beloved he says so as you read this friends you see that paul is appealing to the people that are in the congregation and you sense the fragrance of love that is in this atmosphere uh, in the whole passage you sense it and you will notice in verse 1, the ingredients of love in the fellowship is given. Look at the words Paul uses. He lines them up. He first says, my brethren. He calls them brethren. And today we call them brothers and sisters. Sometimes people use that terminology in a, a very trite and a very casual manner. Hey, brother, you know, that type thing. But I want to assure you that Paul never used it that way. Right. The words brother and sister means that we're in the same family, the family of God by grace. 
and we're brothers and sisters in the Lord and it is a moving word that we use don't ever use the word casually because it is a term of endearment and, and, and I remember a Gaither song that had a line like this it says you have noticed that we say brother and sister around here it's because we are a family and we love each other dear notice the next ingredient of love he not only calls them my brethren but then he says dearly beloved and longed for you will notice in this verse that he uses dearly beloved two times dearly beloved the Apostle Paul was saying to them I love you people dearly and there is the fragrance of love again in this atmosphere he says and I, I long for you he's in a prison he would love to be with these people they're so hospitable they they're of like precious faith and he would love to be with them but he writes from prison because of his stand for Christ and the word there means it means to pursue you dearly beloved and long for long for to pursue he is saying I dearly love you people and I'm reaching out to you in my love how sweet it is when there's love in the fellowship Koinonia, fellowship love all through the years here God has blessed us with a wonderful atmosphere of love there may have been a few bumps in the road but overall it's been good we have a love in our fellowship here that is very special there are many of you who have come to this fellowship and you have found the love of Jesus in this place and you have found many people who will love you regardless of your faults and your past and your flaws just like the Lord is a, a Lord of second chances we're the same way when we make things right we don't hold it against you anymore when you make things right and truly repent and then look at the next ingredient he says my joy and my crown in verse 1 Paul I think is referring to the fact that he has led many of these people to faith in Christ I can imagine that Paul pictures the different individuals in the church in his mind's eye he can almost feel the warm handshake of sister Lydia that he led to Jesus down by the riverside and God opened her heart to who Jesus was I think he can feel the bear hug of the big old burly jailer the Philippian jailer who came out of the prison after the earthquake and said what must I do to be saved and he was saved that night he and his family I think he rejoices when he thinks of the delivered demon-possessed girl all of these are a part of the church of Philippi folks and so he says to them you are my joy and my crown when you lead people to faith in Christ those people become a source of joy in your life one of the great benefits of a long ministry such as the Lord has given me here is that now along the way I'm clipping the coupons of people God has used me to lead to the Lord but don't misunderstand me God just used me to plant the seed and water and to cultivate God alone gives the increase Amen. and to God be the glory salvations of the Lord as Jonah said the further along you go the more you will understand that one of the great sources of your joy though in the Christian life is having a part being used of God to lead someone to Jesus Christ my joy he says in my crown he's basically saying to them that in the present you are my joy but in he's saying in the future when I get to heaven you're gonna be my crown it's as if he is saying that on earth you are a source of rejoicing but in heaven you are a source of reward and there will be rewards even though we will I know I'm going to lay him right at Jesus's feet because I wouldn't be there without him and I don't care what he gives me I'm gonna, I'm gonna lay it right at his feet 
But he, it seems that Paul sees himself before the judgment seat of Christ, the bema seat of Christ, and the Lord is handing out the crowns of rejoicing for people who have been faithful in sharing the gospel of Christ. I, I wonder, will you have any crowns because God used you maybe to lead some lost sinner to Jesus and point him to the one who could save him? Yes, salvation is totally a work of God, and yet he uses people to sow the precious seed of the gospel. He could have used angels, but he uses his church in the Great Commission. As you, you are sowing precious seed, and someone comes to know Christ, it will bless you. And so I ask you, are you sowing the seed? And next Paul gives these people a command, a, a loving command found in verse 1. He says, stand firm or stand fast in the Lord, verse 1. Paul gives the ingredients of love and tenderness, and then he gives a command. It's a firm statement. Uh, the word stand fast in verse 1, as I notice, it's the present imperative. That means keep on standing. Don't, don't just stand once. Keep on standing. It, it was used of a soldier who stood his ground against the onslaught of the enemy. I think this makes me think of Israel. Uh, we need to be praying for Israel. Uh, somewhere the defense was let down and the enemy entered. And a lot of people have been killed. They entered their borders, and they're shooting missiles not just on the outskirts of Israel, but it would be like shooting them into New York City, right into the heart of Israel, probably while I'm preaching today and yesterday. And it, it makes me concerned about our open borders because we're told that 11,000 people are coming in a day into America illegally people are welcome to america but do it legally and they're coming in and some of them i guarantee you are terrorists you don't have eleven thousand coming in a day and don't be surprised when something that like is going on in israel right now starts happening in some of the cities of the united states soon but this is a day for god's people to take a stand firmly for the word of god when many are abandoning the field of battle and when many are stepping aside and, and are not standing up for the Lord Jesus Christ in the principles of the Word of God, the call of this verse of Scripture is to stand firm in the Lord. And when others are running, stand firm. Stand firm. When problems are mounting, stand firm. When the going gets tough, stand firm. You ask, how do you stand firm, preacher? Well, there's a secret of standing firm given right here. It says stand firm in what? In the Lord. It's just like an old oak tree. Been through many storms. But there is an oak tree, and when the winds beat against that oak tree, the oak tree stands firm. But why does it stand firm? Not because that the old oak tree holds onto the soil, but it's because of the soil holds the oak tree, the roots of the oak tree. If you are firmly rooted in the Lord and his word, and if you take a stand in the Lord Jesus, the winds of adversity when they blow, when the enemies of our culture attack our faith as believers in Christ, we stand firm in the Lord. Stand firm, stand fast. Isn't that a beautiful appeal and command that Paul gives here? He, he appeals to the people to stand firm in the Lord. But next, here's the problem. Paul's appeal to these two ladies, he repeal, appeals to them to resolve their conflict. There's a problem in the church at Philippi. Look at verse 2. I beseech you, Odious, and beseech Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. The problem has been hinted at gently along the way as we have studied through the book of Philippians. 
He has made an appeal, for instance, let this mind be in you. Apparently there was some in the church at Philippi, maybe the mind of Christ did not seem to be in them. He, he has talked about the importance so far in these four chapters of harmony in the congregation, but now Paul does not dodge the issue. Paul meets the issue head on. He addresses the problem directly. So it makes me think maybe it's been going on a little while and he's had enough and needs to deal with it under inspiration of God. He says in verse 2, I beseech. And then the word beseech is a very, very tender word. It's a word that literally means to call alongside of. There's a problem in the church, and Paul, rather than be dictatorial, becomes very pastoral in the atmosphere. You can just see it in verse 1 as he begins to address them. And he says, I beseech you, Odious and Syntyche, who are they? Well, they're two ladies in the church. Ladies. Apparently, when you got these two sisters together, the fur would fly. You know what I mean? The fur would fly. And you've got to keep in mind that there are two things that Paul says about these two ladies that some people just don't see when they read through it. Number one, they're saved ladies. They're precious ladies. They have tender hearts. But they're saved ladies. You will notice it says in verse 3 that their names are in the book of life. These are saved ladies. And the second thing you've got to know is that they have been of great assistance, a tremendous help to the Apostle Paul on his missionary journeys in the work of the Lord. Not only are they saved ladies, they are serving ladies. They have a heart for the lost. They want to see the gospel spread. So Paul says in verse 3, these women have labored with me, he says, in the gospel. These were good Christian women. They were, these were good-hearted women. And yet they had a fallen out. You say, preacher, I didn't know that those kind of things happened in the early church or in the New Testament. Yes, they did. Probably a lot of them that we don't even know about in the early church. A lot of things. The books couldn't contain all that happened, you know, the Bible says. But would you be surprised to know that those kind of things still happen in churches today? Would you be surprised? Born again, say people have misunderstandings. Their personalities maybe are, are different. Some people look at things one way. Some people look at things another way. Sometimes there's more than one way to do things, too. Amen. But here are two good sisters in the church, and they've had a squabble. <coughs> I want to say, first of all, that I thank God for the women of the church. I, I'm not picking on the women today. This is what I come to. i got to deal with it. That, that's what happens when you preach expositionally through a book. you got to deal with what you come to. We have our churches. Um, I thank God for the women in this church. It couldn't function properly without them. We probably have uh, over 150 different positions that women hold in this ministry. But at the same time, our church is a strong men's church. Most, uh, I've been in churches where you'd have 35 women in the choir and two men. Men just sitting on the back seats, you know, wouldn't sing. And uh, they'd have a deacon board and six ladies and one man on the deacon board. We don't have, this is a strong men's church, folks. And that's biblical. That's the way it should be. We should be leaders in the church. We should be leaders in our home. We're not dictators. We should lead in love. Husbands lead in love. I've always believed a woman doesn't mind following a man who leads in love. But that, I'm, I'm, I, that's Bible. But uh, we have strong men leaders in our church, but we are in the dead and gratitude of good, godly women in our fellowship. Thank God for the women of Faith Memorial Baptist Church. 
Thank what women have contributed to the church for the Lord's glory down through the ages. Think about the sons and daughters that have been trained for ministry and for, for the mission field. Think about the service of women that they have rendered in places where they never got maybe any mention at all for their service to the Lord. I think of my mother, a great help to my dad. I think of my wife. A lot of times our wives, they're sort of in the background and, and preachers sometimes can get a lot of credit and of course we need to give God all the glory but sometimes our wives without a good wife I would never have been able to accomplish some of the things that God has used me to accomplish Amen. but think about the service women, women have rendered think about the songs that women have written Women like Fanny Crosby. Think about the prayers which the women of this congregation have offered up to the Lord. I, I've got a nucleus of women in this church that tell me they pray for me every day. You don't know what that means to And pray for our staff every day. Pray for us. I had the ladies that went out this morning and said, Preacher, we pray for, I pray for you every day. I pray for the staff every day. And that means the world. Think about the service in so many areas that women serve in in this ministry. So we're not picking on the women this morning, but we've got to lay it out here about what's going on. Not only is it possible for the sisters in the congregation to have problems one another with one another, but it is possible for men in the congregation to have problems with one another. Somebody, you don't like the way they do things, maybe they're a little come across wrong, hurt your feelings a little bit, and you get out of everything. See, it's even possible for deacons and choir members to have problems with one another. Right. Well, we don't know just exactly what happened here. Paul doesn't go into the details of the problem that was going on here. He doesn't say who's right in the situation. I don't know who was right. Maybe both of them were wrong. I heard about two ladies on the train. They got into a squabble about the windows on the train. One of them said, if you don't lower that window, I'm going to die of pneumonia. The other woman said, if you, you don't lower that window, I'm going to suffocate to death. One of the passengers got tired of hearing them squabble back and forth and said, why don't we just lower the window until you die of pneumonia and raise the window until you suffocate so the rest of us can have some peace. When you preach on a subject like this, you need a little bit of laughter. You know what I mean? <laughs> Maybe these two women disagreed. Euodius and Syntyche over the color of the carpet that was to go in the Sunday school class. Maybe they had four curriculums and they disagreed over the curriculum for the children to study in Sunday school or in the children's ministry. But the next thing you know, one says a little hateful word and the other says another little hateful word. And the next thing you know, they've got themselves in a bad argument. And the next thing you know, they are not even speaking to one another at all. And then they get their spouses involved. And the next thing you know, they start enlisting sympathizers in the church. Would you believe what sister so-and-so said to me? What an ungodly thing to be and do. The next thing you know, the church is choosing sides, and all of a sudden that church of joy is disrupted and upset and divided. That's what Satan wants. Amen. He loves to divide and to destroy. Well, we could take that analogy to the army. There's nothing worse than perhaps a battalion who is marching out of step. Do you remember Sergeant Carter? Any of you that old or is it just me? <laughs> Sergeant Carter and Gummer Pyle. And the sergeant kept yelling at Pyle because he was the only one that kept getting out of step. 
Sergeant Carter would say, turn, turn left, turn left, and he'd turn right. <laughs> but, but when a battalion is out of staff, it looks awful, and it just takes away the whole uniformity of the exercise that they're carrying out. And um, I mentioned this morning, have you ever been watching the news or, and, and a man's mouth is moving in a different synchronization to the words that are coming out of his mouth? You ever, I hate that. <laughs> and I turn it. I'm not going to watch it. I'll watch CNN before I watch <laughs> that. In those two analogies, we could say this, that to enjoy these experiences, there has to be harmony, right? And in a church, if there's to be joy, there has to be harmony. And sometimes it doesn't take very much to disrupt the harmony. Things have to be working together if we're going to glorify God. And disharmony was going on now in this church of joy called Philippi. It has reached the point where Paul deals with it. And he not only deals with it, he calls names. you got to realize, let, get the picture here. There was a letter to the church at Philippi written by the apostle Paul while he's in prison. Written to the believers in this church. And, and it would be read to the congregation probably on a Sunday morning worship, and they are eager to hear it read because Paul has reached many of them. They love the Apostle Paul, and so they're eager to hear from him how he's doing. And they're reading through this letter, and then all of a sudden, like a bolt of lightning out of nowhere, Paul says in verse 2, I beseech Euodius, and I beseech Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Apparently, they're not in the same mind or he wouldn't be dealing with this. A problem is going on. So he calls out their names and there they sit. If I called out your name this morning because you were into it with somebody, would that bother you a little? You know, he, he says, you Otis, and she just swallows, almost swallows her tongue. And he says, send a key. And she burst into tears. She seems to know where he's going. Paul probably never took a course on how to win friends and influence people. Can you imagine the tension in the air that day at church when he calls these sisters by name? But let me ask you a question. May I ask you a question? Is there some little squabble going on between you and some other believer in the fellowship? Is there somebody you won't even speak to at church or you won't speak to in the choir or you won't speak to in the youth group? Is there somebody you just want to avoid? You shun them at all costs. Can you imagine how it was when people got to heaven and they're introducing folks in heaven and there are the new arrivals in heaven and the angel Gabriel is introducing folks in heaven and he says, I want to introduce to you these new arrivals, he says, here is Euodius, and here is Syntyche. And the new arrival, one of them says, Euodius and Syntyche, you're the two ladies that had that big fuss that's mentioned in the Bible. Wouldn't that be awful? So, how would you like to be introduced in heaven as getting your name in the Bible because you had a fuss with another believer? Notice what he says, I beseech you, Odious, I beseech Syndicate, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. He's saying, settle your differences. He's saying, get on the same page. And that doesn't mean that they're, they always have to agree on every point. I mean, maybe my deacons and I, uh, or the pastors, that we maybe don't agree on every point. When you work together for years, but if they've got a better idea, I want to hear it. And if it's better than mine, I'll get right on the boat with them on, on the idea. But believers are different, and we have different opinions. And it doesn't mean that you have to agree together on dress or uh, agree on diet or, or to agree on your cooking ideas or what you're going to do in the church on everything. 
But it does mean that you all agree that the most important thing in a church is to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and to be sure that nothing is done to harm the unity and the ministry and the testimony of the church. Amen. Nothing. 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 But you say, but I'm right. It doesn't matter whether you're right or not. There are times when you need to be silent before the Lord and let God work out the problem. But there are also times when you need a mediator. Right. You need a go-between. And that's where Paul goes with this. Thirdly, Paul's appeal to a peacemaker to help reconcile these two women in the church. Look at verse 3. And I entreat thee also true yoke fella he's a fellow help those women which labored with me and the gospel with clement also and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life the greek word used here for yoke fella is sutsogos sutsogos it means someone who works well in harmony with others, a yoke fellow, a, a great and genuine companion. It, it could have been Epaphroditus because he is the man who brought this letter back to Philippi. Or it could have been someone else. It doesn't say. It just calls him a yoke fellow. The truth of the matter is we don't really know who it is, but it's somebody in the church that had a uniquely uh, gifted way about him and he is a peacemaker he has a way of bringing people together and you remember what jesus said about that in the beatitudes he says blessed is the peacemaker paul says true yoke fella help those women he is saying you are a peacemaker come alongside these women and help them Sometimes we get our problems so tangled up in our pride, get so involved, and, and things have, have gone so far that we're not able to solve the problems that we have with someone ourselves. And so we need a peacemaker. Let me ask you a question this morning. Are you a troublemaker or a peacemaker? Are you a source of confusion? Are you a source of reconciliation, helping people reconcile? It's not an easy job to be a peacemaker. I can, I can tell you from experience, it, it's a dangerous job because sometimes the fire, it, it will fall on you when you in love try to reconcile people and you can become a villain. Sometimes the best you can do. And so help those women, he says, to this yoke fellow. Uh, how did he go about it? Well, we can use our imaginations here for a moment, if we would. Maybe after things kind of settled down a little bit, maybe the peacemaker said, You odious? Sent a key? I want both of you to come over to my house for supper Friday night. Well, I don't know if I can get in the same room with her or not. And the other one says, after what she said to me, I don't want to be around her, ever. And he says, come on now. Do it for me. Do it for the sake of the church. And do it for the glory of God. And so, lo and behold, they come over to the young fellow's house, maybe Epaphroditus. Can you imagine the atmosphere this true peacemaker says, you odious. You remember Sunday when, that Sunday when you got saved and, uh, and do you remember that Santa Key when you got saved? And, and I remember that you personally led her to faith in Christ. And big old tears begin to well up in you Otis's eyes. And he says, ladies, I remember when you used to go visiting together and your families would eat together. And I remember what joy it was on a Sunday morning to see you both joyfully serving the Lord together. 
And you owed us in sin to key. Let, let's just get down on our knees. And let's thank the Lord for all the good things that he's done for us. And let's thank the Lord for saving us and putting up with us in spite of our faults and our failures and our sins. And they get down on their knees and they pray. And when it's all over, they embrace one another. And there's harmony and there's joy in the church once again. Is there anybody here this morning that has anybody in this fellowship that you have a major problem with? Could I urge you to make every effort for the sake of the Lord and his glory to get it settled? You say, I don't know how they're going to respond. It doesn't matter how they respond. <coughs> Just put forth every effort to get it settled. Resolving conflict is necessary so that the church can focus on the main things, so that it can focus on the work of the gospel, teaching people the word of God, and focus on the glory of God. That's my message. Let us pray. Heavenly Father.